Hello and welcome to today's webinar on authentic community engagement. My name is Lisa Patterson and I will be introducing the webinar today. I'm the Tech Transfer and Workforce Development Program Manager for TRAC, the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University. TRAC is home to the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, or NITSI, the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation, or IBPI, and other transportation programs. TREC produces research and tools for transportation decision makers, develops K-12 curriculum to expand the diversity and capacity of the workforce, engages and engages students and young professionals through education. We have partnered with the Oregon chapter of the American Planning Association, OAPA, to bring you this webinar. Emma Johnson from Berger Abam and Kate Rogers from Angelo Planning Group are members of the Professional Development Committee and will moderate the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. OAPA is an independent, not-for-profit educational organization that provides leadership in the development of vital communities by advocating excellence in community planning, promoting education and citizen empowerment, and providing tools and support necessary to meet the challenges of growth and change. Our speakers today are Aaron D. Minky from Metro and Wendy Serrano from TriMet. Since 1999, Aaron Key has served as a liaison between government agencies and the people they serve. Ms. Key has extensive experience facilitating small groups, large events, and collaboration between public agencies. She brings a strong passion for working with divergent groups through collaborative processes. She has designed and implemented public involvement and outreach programs for numerous visioning, land use, redevelopment, urban renewal, and transportation projects in Oregon, Washington, and California. Erin earned her master's in city planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has served on the National Planning Accreditation Board and is a board member for the Carleton College Alumni Annual Fund. She has volunteered as a mediator with Resolutions Northwest and Clackamas County Small Claims Court. Wendy, raised in Guadalajara, Mexico, is bilingual and bicultural. She immigrated to Milwaukee, Oregon with her family as an 11-year-old, having to learn English and adjust to a different community structure. Wendy is passionate about advocacy and community engagement of underrepresented groups and has worked in Oregon over the last decade with various nonprofits, government leaders, and public agencies in efforts to engage Latino and immigrant community groups in policy planning and implementation, education, economic development, affordable housing, and transportation efforts. Wendy earned her bachelor's in communication studies at Portland State University and a master's in business administration from George Fox University. She serves as a board commissioner for Home Forward, formerly known as the Housing Authority of Portland. All right, before diving into the webinar, I'd like to give you um, some information on upcoming OAPA and truck events. Um, OAPA, in partnership with DLCD, is hosting the Northwest Planners Network Meeting, which will be provide training for planning officials, focusing on statewide legislative updates and best practices. The annual OAPA conference will be held October 18th through 19th and will be located in Bend. And lastly, save the day for OAPA's annual Legal Issues Workshop to be held on December 7th in Portland. All right, a few track events that are upcoming. We have our annual Transportation and Communities Conference this year on September 13th and 14th. We're providing 15 half-day workshops that will be hands-on and provide deep dive training in a small classroom setting. On September 28th, Aaron Golub from Portland State University and Vivian Satterfield, with, formerly with Opal, now with Verde, will kick off our Fall fr Friday Transportation Seminar Series discussing community-based assessment of transportation needs to inform City of Portland's Smart Cities Plan. Our next webinar will be on October 16th with Sarisha Koturi from Portland State University, who will present on addressing bicycle vehicle conflicts with alternative or alternate signal control strategies. And lastly, on October 17th, we are hosting Elise Roy as our Ann Niles Active Transportation Guest Lecturer on Designing for Dis Disability. Uh, this is just some more information on our Transportation and Communities Conference. Um, I highlighted four workshops that I thought this audience might be particularly interested in, and there is the registration link at tca2018.sketch.com. All right, and last slide before I hand it over to Erin and Wendy, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the webinar. Erin and Wendy will present for about 40 minutes. During this time, please submit questions, which will be answered at the end of the webinar. We will be recording today's webinar and we'll make it available on our website. And you will also receive the video recording and presentation slides in an email following the webinar in the next day or two. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education education credit and instructions on how to redeem that credit will also be involved included in the post webinar email. 
During the presentation, you may submit questions by using the questions pane on your control panel. We will track questions and Aaron and Wendy will respond to them at the end of the webinar. If we do run out of time, we'll send out written responses for any questions left unanswered. All right, and with that, I will hand over the presentation to Aaron. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm happy to uh, start off this presentation today on authentic community engagement. During today's presentation, we'll, induce, we'll introduce these three, um, we're gonna introduce three important steps, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, that are really important to making sure that your community engagement is authentic. Um, I'm gonna start off the presentation and then Wendy will jump in, and then I will wrap it up at the end and we'll both be available for questions. So these are those three important steps that I think are really critical to making sure that your community engagement is not only well done, but that it's authentic. The key for me to authentic community engagement is making sure that the engagement has a purpose, that it has an impact on the transportation project you're planning. It's critical that you engage the right people and that you engage them at the right time in your process so that they can make a difference. If you don't spend this time up front doing the right reflection and strategizing, your implementation might fall short. Too often, I see professionals jump to this third step. We often start with the tools we wish to use, the type of meeting we want to have or the activity we want to host. It's a very common mistake and it's completely natural. I get it. It's fun to think about the activities we want to have. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been approached by someone and said, we need a committee, will you help us form one? Or we need to hold a meeting, uh, what should I do first? Thinking about activities is fun and frankly, it's efficient. However, the risk is that you may not get the right people in the room. Even worse, you may have a great event with a super activity and lots of involvement but it won't actually change your project or influence decisions because you haven't timed it right or you asked the wrong questions. That has the risk of really angering your community and breaking trust. Community members who are engaged in your project want to be heard and they want to see that their voice had impact. If they don't see evidence of that influence, they'll be disappointed and you'll have conducted an inauthentic process. And it's unfortunately too easy to um, jump ahead in public involvement and then ask the wrong questions and find that you then can't use the answers you got from the public in actually the design of your project. So this is what I want to help you try to avoid. So whenever I get approached by someone with asking me those questions about their meeting or their committee, my response is usually, let's step back a moment and tell me a bit about the goals you have for this event. What is the purpose? What do you want to try to get out of it? So if you remember nothing else from today, remember don't jump right to thinking about what you want to do. Um, spend a little time getting ready for that. And I'll walk you through some of those steps. Um, and I'll just reflect a minute too. We want community engaged in our projects, not for the sake of engagement. You are all here, part of this conversation because you want to know how to make your engagement authentic. It's really about how to make the transportation project you're working on a better project because you heard new information that you might not have had access to. To do that, you have to do this reflection and the strategizing about the purpose of your engagement. You have to understand your project's process and the important decision points along the way so that you're getting information at the right time. You also need to think about who should be involved. Um, and only after that do we decide the right activities and tools to use that um, will attract those people that you want to get involved. And so those are the steps that we're going to focus on in this presentation. So reflect, strategize, implement were the three important steps that I um, talked about. And here are some guiding questions to help you with those. Why engage, when to engage, who to engage, and what resources and what tools, activities do you want to use? I encourage you to step through this in, in this order of thinking as you prepare for the public engagement for your project. So in that way, authentic engagement begins with the basics. And I'm going to talk about those questions in turn. So we'll start with why. And here's where you're reflecting. And here are some reflective type questions that you might ask yourself. You know, what is the purpose of the engagement? I've said this a couple times. Um, how is it going to make your project better? Um, 
think about how the community can influence project decisions. It's not going to be the same for every project. And when is that feedback needed so that it can be most effective, so that there's time and opportunity to affect designs or choices along the way because of that feedback. Um, the International Association of Public Participation has a couple of really useful tools that I'm going to introduce you to. You may have seen these before. This one in particular is very popular. So the International Association of Public Participation, is um, the acronym is IAP2. Um, this is their spectrum of public involvement. And the idea here is that um, every project's engagement will fall into one of these categories. Um, and it's possible that different phases of your project could actually fall into different categories. There's, and it's all about the level of engagement. So as you move from um, left to right, you're increasing the level of engagement and the level of influence that people have in the project, the, the increasing level of public impact. And don't think that there's a good or bad level of involvement. Being on the left doesn't make your project bad and being on the right doesn't make your project good. It's really just a way of reflecting and understanding the truth about your project. How much influence can people have? If people who are involved in your project think they'll have a higher level of impact than they will, they will be upset with you for misinforming them. And I should point out that it is per totally natural for uh, the public, uh, the folks that you have engaged in your project, to tend to think they have more influence than they do. So it is your job to be very, very plain and clear about what the, the actual impact that they can have. And you, you often have to say this over and over and over again for it to begin to settle in for people about what their influence can be because they want it to be more, which is understandable, right? You can also have people on the other side, of course, who are saying, yeah, but well, whatever I say doesn't matter. You're never really listening. You're only doing this because you have to. Um, and again, I want to say that Reflecting on these tools will help you have a more authentic answer when you come back, um, when you hear from people who say things like that. So I'm going to talk about each of these categories. Uh, the, so it's all about honesty. It's about knowing where you are so you can communicate that to everyone else. Uh, on the left, we're going to start there with inform. This is primarily information sharing. So uh, a good example of these are maybe a a road improvement project that's already designed and it's moving into either final design or construction. So the opportunities to change the width of the bike lane or add a new amenity, those that, that opportunity has passed. Your project is not in a place where the design is particularly flexible anymore. Now it's about construction schedules and how to um, control impacts to property owners and businesses during construction, for instance. Um, transit schedule changes, anything, you can think of anything in this category that you want people to have information about. You're trying to avoid surprises. That could be your goal. So the level of impact that the public can have on changing your project is, pro is very, very small. That's why it's on the left of this. Um, however, you want to get the information out. So again, you want to be honest about this and you're communicating the fact like, well, this design is complete. It's 100% done. We're not making changes to the design. but we want you to know about construction um, before it happens, or we want your help in planning our construction project. Anyway, whatever it is, you get the point. You're trying to be honest about what you're asking for. So let's move to the right. The next level is called consult. This is where you're asking for feedback on a plan or a draft concept. I think you have probably participated in something that was a consulting. You might have a draft plan and you're taking it out looking for feedback. It could be you're going out at 30% design or, um, or somewhere lower in your design um, schedule and you're, you're showing preliminary designs and you're getting feedback. As long as this is timed well, um, consult can be a real opportunity for people to actually have changes to a designer plan. But they're essentially providing, con they're providing ideas and feedback into your process that then staff is going to work with and ultimately that decision is, is going to be made by staff or some other level of decision makers. Involve goes a little bit higher. So in Involve, you're not just consulting once or twice. This involves more frequent engagement in your project decisions. So a committee could fall into this category if you have a, a committee that's meeting regularly, providing um, advice to staff or advice to decision elected officials or other decision makers. 
it could be a set of meetings or a set of charrettes, a, a set of design workshops, but you're checking in with people regularly along the process to have those participants influence several decisions along the way, not just one. Continue moving to the right with higher levels of public input. Input You've got collaborate. So similar to the good, this is similar to consult, but in this situation, you actually give away a significant amount of the decision-making authority to the community. Um, I've seen this play out in uh, committees that are made up of both elected officials and community members. And the agreement is that together that committee will decide what the outcome of the project is. You're gonna honestly see this less, I think, on transportation capital projects, um, where it's very difficult to give over that kind of um, decision-making authority to the community. Um, but it does happen. Um, Powell Division was an example here at Metro. The planning for um, um, that transit project um, had a collaborative um, committee that worked during the early planning stages. Um, empowerment is the furthest to the right. It's fairly rare. This is where the community has full authority to make decisions about a project. Um, in my lifetime of working in public involvement, I haven't seen one of these, um, but I think it's an ideal that we often um, should think about and stretch to, but in truth, collaborate and empower are fairly rare. We see most of our activities falling into the first three, inform, consult, or involve. So anyway, that's a very helpful tool that um, we've spent a lot of time here now talking about, but um, I hope it's something that you'll reflect on. You can easily, um, you'll get a copy of this presentation, but you can also just Google IP, IAP2 Spectrum and find plenty of um, images and discussions about that. So I'm going to move on now to, you're still in the strategize, now you're in strategizing, excuse me, phase, and you're asking questions about when. So how, what, I talked about wanting to get people involved at the right time. So imagine that simple image to the right is your project schedule. You want to look at your project schedule and you're identifying decision points. So where is it that staff needs certain information before a decision is made about something? Um, maybe it's in advance of your decision makers weighing in on a decision. Um, it's going to be unique to each project, but that's what you're, you're eyeing for is what, what that timing is. And then thinking about when you need that feedback in order to, for it to have a chance to influence the decisions that are coming up. Next in your strategizing, you want to think about who. Um, thinking about who you want to engage is important because you probably don't have the resources to involve everyone in the community. Um, you might also consider who are the most likely to follow your project and focus your attention on who's potentially the most impacted, um, but the least likely to engage without additional effort on your part. So I'm going to show you another great tool also International Association of Public Participation. This is the orbits of public participation. Um, I like to use this because it's a helpful tool to think about, um, about who, brainstorming the different groups of people you may want to engage in your process. Um, and while the focus is not on demographics, in this case, it's about on interest and capacity to be involved. So again, like the, um, like the previous um, image that I showed you, your decision here is at the beginning, and those who are closest in the inner circle are the deciders, those who are actually making the, the decision. So this can help you think about, to be honest, don't be surprised if it's difficult to recognize who is the decision maker in your project. Um, that's not unusual either. Um, but it typically, it's often staff or management level staff or um, elected officials. That's often who's in the deciders category. Um, their advisors, um, you could have uh, deciders, uh, let's see, sorry, planners are typically your agency staff too, um, but there might be committees that would fall into planners, people who are engaged and will participate frequently with your project. Um, reviewers are the people in your community that are certain to read all the information you put out. Um, if you've done some engagement activities or projects, you probably know these people. Um, they are your regular folks, the ones that are often involved. Um, you know them by name. <laughs> um, they'll read your technical reports from cover to cover. Um, observers are interested, but they don't have the time or resources to get as highly involved as your advisors um, and reviewers. 
So observers um, might not have the financial um, means to participate at a higher level. They may have family responsibilities, jobs, um, mobility issues that it make it difficult that are challenges or roadblocks to, for them to be involved. Um, and then unsurprised apathetics, it's not really the best name. It's not my favorite name. But um, the idea here is that this outside group are the folks who might care about your project, but you just are struggling to get their attention. And that could be for some of the same reasons as, the, as observers. They don't have the means um, to get involved, or they might just be distracted by the thousands and thousands of things um, vying for people's attention these days on the internet, on TV, in your mailbox. It can be very difficult to get people's attention. Um, so even if someone could be impacted by your project, they might be in this apathetics, cate apathetics category because they just don't, um, you're not getting their attention. The outer folk, the outer ring folks, the, your observers, your unsurprised apathetics, they need more support to be involved because they can't afford to take the time out of their day to participate. Or like I said, they have kids, they have food they need to get on the table. Um, they have two jobs, three jobs. They might be very busy and bombarded with information. So they're not exactly apathetic, um, but they might be distracted. So I tend, these are the groups I tend to think about and be very strategic about, um, observers and the apathetics. That's where I want to spend my time and resources um, because I probably don't have to spend as much time and resources on the folks in the inner circles because no matter what I do, they're going to be involved. Um, at Metro and TriMet, we also focus a lot on equity when thinking about our target audiences for engagement. In this context, that means identifying the historically marginalized and the underserved in our community, and that's most often a target audience for us as well. If you don't know who you need to involve, you can start with a demographic analysis of your project area to learn about your community's um, racial makeup or the makeup of a, a more, a maybe a corridor area if you're working on a, a corridor transportation type project. Um, you can look at income levels and language speak, spoken at home. You can find um, a lot of this usually within your own agencies, but you can always go to the census to find some of this information too. And thanks, Erin, for uh, starting us off. This is Wendy Serrano, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. Um, thank you for tuning in today and continue on to who you're reaching out to. I'd like to, as Erin mentioned, cover the most vulnerable groups and um, a lot of, I work for a tri transit agency, so at TriMed we have to follow a certain extent of um, outreach to minority, low income, and um, limited English proficiency communities, um, also as part of our Title VI uh, requirements by the Federal Transit Administration. So it is important to identify early on, as Erin mentioned, who those communities are, and oftentimes our agencies don't have the capacity to have close tied relationships with, with those communities. Um, so what we found helpful have been community-based organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations who are already doing the work um, to service those communities. Um, that often also comes in the in the way of churches, um, community leaders, um, so advocates for those communities. And so identifying those partnerships uh, will be key in, in your outreach and engagement of these community groups. At the same time, you need to be very prudent about the extent of um, engagement that you're doing with the CBOs, with the churches and the community leaders, um, because you will also need to bring resources to the table. Um, that will need to show up in financial support um, because you need to expect that um, we need to compensate people for the work they do. Um, oftentimes, um, just because somebody's an advocate and a community leader, um, it doesn't mean that their work should be uh, going on paid and that the help that they put in for our projects or for moving our engagement along um, shouldn't be um, compensated. So, um, so we'll start from there. And I think that when you think of community-based organizations, you also have to think not just of them as facilitators, but they will also inform your process of reaching out to the turnout. So that may include ethnic media. Um, we need to recognize that we oftentimes do ads on newsprint media, and that is definitely not the best way to approach um, LEP communities or low-income communities who maybe aren't um, 
able to you know always access that type of um, media. So it's important to recognize that the CBOs and the non-governmental organizations, uh, community leaders, are not just the people that gather uh, folks for your engagement or facilitate the gathering, but they also inform the process of, of your engagement, including the activities that you may be able to, to um, impart with them. So if we go on to the next slide, um, you'll notice that partnerships matter not just within the community-based organizations, but also with other agency partners. Um, an example here that you could see is, as Erin had mentioned before, Powell Division um, offers metro event, moving on to climate. Um, we had an extensive project where we were covering 14 miles of corridor. It was one of the most diverse groups that we've done work with. Uh, identified, we identified five top languages. Um, that, um, sorry, there's maybe static in the background. Okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, for Division Transit Project, we identified the top five languages after doing our analysis of the corridor, and that came to be um, English, Spanish, um, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Russian. Um, once we did all that groundwork, we also started looking at what other projects were happening in, happening in the corridor, and there were various projects from the local city and, um, and other entities. So we also didn't want to exhaust the community by asking them to come out to different events on, on different um, different times to talk about different projects. We need to be mindful that a lot of community members just see all of us regardless of the agency as government entities, um, and they might not have a clear um, understanding or who does what. So what we try to do for this open house is to get all the partners, agency partners that we uh, knew had projects in the area to come to the open house to partner with us and to present their information all at the same time. Um, and, and it turned out to be very helpful because I think that not just the community-based organizations, but the community itself we're really grateful that they could get all the information at once. Some of them were more interested about one project than the other, and that turned out to be very helpful. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we can understand now what type of resources you need to be bringing to the table in order to engage these communities. Um, it is important to recognize, as I mentioned, that you need to provide other services that oftentimes maybe you're not used to providing when you're um, just doing a big open house um, for everyone in the community. When you're working with focus groups, especially the ones that we've been mentioning, um, you need to meet community where they're at. And that means bringing other resources to those events, such as childcare, such as making sure you're compensating them for their time if you can. Oftentimes, um, at TriMed, we like to do um, hop cards that have fare loaded into them, or if we can be able to purchase gift cards from uh, a grocery store or, you know, gifts like that are, are often a good way to make sure that people are having a benefit out of, out of their time because, in essence, they're really allowing you to inform your project um, and to make it more meaningful at the end of the day. So we should be trying to compensate them as well for their time, and we should be trying to have them see benefit in their time being involved. Um, and when you think of the activities and the events that can be comfortable and fun for the community, you have to be really working with your community partners to make sure that the activities are culturally relevant. They're, there's a lot of different norms that we may not be exposed to depending on the group that you're working with. Um, and whenever possible, if, you, if your agency does have staff that is bilingual um, or multi multicultural, it is very important to also make sure that those folks are involved in this process and at the events um, because it is reassuring to be able to talk to people that can speak the language that you're speaking um, and not necessarily always be relying on the interpreters. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, um, we can give you another example. As I mentioned, through Division Transit Project, um, we partner with a community-based organization by the name of Apano. And through our partnership, we were able to 
um, hire uh, what we call transportation fellows. And these folks were uh, folks from the Chinese and Vietnamese community. Um, what I did before our open house was train them on the materials that we were going to be sharing at the open house. Um, so that included our fact sheet where there was really technical information um, that I knew would be difficult to get across. So we were able to give them an overview for about an hour of what the project was, what kind of feedback we were hoping people would be willing to give us. And it turned out to be a true success um, we collected a lot of post-its and common cards through that through that engagement and m a lot of them were in Vietnamese and in Chinese and it was just really reassuring to see that people were putting their thoughts in pieces of paper and and that encouraged I believe others to do the same so we ended up collecting comments in Vietnamese Chinese and Russian which was a true success and I think a lot of it is the thinking outside of the box so not just hoping that interpreters or translators are going to be able to also understand our very technical materials, but taking the time to take people from the community that can actually help people navigate through the paperwork, through the fact sheets, through the open house, and be more comfortable of a setting for them to be able to share their input and share their ideas. And if we go into the next slide, You can see that you have to also be going to the events that are highly attended by folks in your community. This is an event for Southwest Quarter, um, and we try to make it fun by, you know, giving up, giving away things so people were able to spin the wheel for, for different types of gifts. Um, we were able to collect common cards, but at the same time, it was... It was a funner environment than you're used to seeing at a community meeting where people have to go out of their way to actually attend. Um, this example also reminds me of an event we did a pop-up at the Supermercado, so that's in 174th Outer Division um, in Portland, Oregon, and we were able to collect about 60 to 70 comments in the period of about three hours. Um, myself and another staffer um, just went out there with a bunch of boards and, and handouts, and we were talking about the Division Transit Project, mainly to Spanish-speaking community members. Both of us were bilingual, and what we ended up doing is we just got a bunch of snacks and we were handing them out outside of the store. I had a relationship with the with the, the store owner and they granted us permission to be out there. Um, and it was incredible that in such a small amount of time we were able to touch so many different people. And honestly, people were asking us, like, can we sign something for you? This sounds like a great project. Um, they were mainly shocked that that we were just there to inform them because they, we wanted them to know about the project. So it, it does, uh, you know, the community appreciates you being, um, being able to interact with them and they appreciate being able to give their opportunity of participation. Um, and if we go into the next and my last slide, um, just a reminder again that you need to make these events culturally specific depending the group that you're working um, that you're working on, and that will require some cultural competence um, from the people that are putting together these events and this engagement. And when you don't have that within your agency, it is so valuable and important to go to those community-based organizations that can provide the feedback that will guide your engagement. Um, and again, it is important to understand that that will require a budget, it will require time and planning, and it will require a train-the-trainer um, sort of style workshop where you will be oftentimes putting your project in the hands of the facilitators and the CBOs and you just have to have a lot of information uh, and communication between the, the two of you um, or the two groups in order to make it a successful um, event. And at the end of the day, think of these as partnerships in the long run. Don't think of this as just for this project because a lot of us are in agencies that are going to be around for many, many years. So it is very valuable that we take the time to invest in the communities that we're trying to serve and that we work together with those other community organizations that are already part of that community. With that, I'll wrap it up and hand it over to Erin again. Erin, you might be muted still if you're trying to talk. I was. I had some really great things to say just then. <laughs> 
and I'll say them again. Okay, while we're looking at this um, great picture, I want, I'm gonna tell you a series of stories about just examples of engagement that we've done recently um, at Metro and with TriMet. Um, and I'm gonna tell you some that were success stories and some that were not, um, because I wanna highlight too that this is a learning process and you win some and you lose some, and that's completely fine. Um, we do our best. So I'm gonna start with a, a story that didn't go fantastically. It's actually this great picture we did a lot of things right. We wanted to do, we were, this is for the Southwest Corridor light rail project. We were in a phase of the project where there were not a lot of decisions happening, but there were going to be some important decisions coming up in the next six months. So the purpose of our engagement, and we knew what that was, the purpose was to um, bring more awareness about the project and bring attention to the fact that we were planning a light rail project um, in, in people's community. So this event, event was targeted to the Vietnamese population in the Tigard, um, kind of Metzger, Southwest Portland, kind of South Portland, or Southwest Portland area. We, um, we wanted to do a table to make information available to people um, as they finished um, church services at a Catholic church that has specific Vietnamese, um, a Vietnamese language service. So we worked with the church to um, to be able to set up, and we set up just outside between the exit to the um, services and the parking lot. It was a beautiful summer day, and um, we had a Vietnamese staff person here at Metro who was able to help us make our table um, culturally relevant. We had um, this was it was these are moon cakes and they're um, a special food to eat during a particular time of the year. And it was that time of year, so we bought these mooncakes and had them available for people. Um, and we have, of course, a Viet her, that staff person there is a Vietnamese speaker to um, talk with folks at the table also. So the doors of the church open up and everyone starts flooding out and we're so excited. We're all standing there happy and welcome, ready to welcome people and tell them about our project. And it was like the, the Red Sea parting that people just went right around us, straight to the parking lot. Um, hardly anyone stopped and talked to us. Uh, we began to ask. So there's a bit of background noise happening again. Make sure you're muted, please. Um, it turned out people thought we were trying to sell something. They were very suspicious of what we were doing there. We left out a very important point. We'd worked with the church, but we hadn't really done enough relationship building with the pastor um, who does the Vietnamese service so that it was announced during service. It should have been announced at the end of service if they um, that we were there, that we were a trusted person, that we were, it was good to learn information from us. We skipped that step, and so people didn't know who we were or what we were doing, and they did not trust us, even though we had food. Um, that was not enough to build trust. So we needed to take a few extra steps in our planning process to have made that one completely successful. So it was a great learning experience about um, how to um, how to do a little bit more work ahead of time to get what you want to achieve. Um, this next example, this was a very successful event. Um, this is was also Southwest Corridor. Um, you can see I'm standing up at the front there in my cream colored shirt. Um, this was also, this was at St. Anthony's Church in Tigard. This was during the comment period for our draft environmental impact statement on the Southwest Corridor project. Our purpose of the meeting was that we specifically wanted to have a, um, a comfortable and accessible meeting for the Spanish speaking community primarily, but also low income and um, rental um, people who rent in the Tigard area. We partnered with um, Unite Oregon, um, who had been working with a, a coalition of other CBOs, including Opal and Community Alliance of Tenants. They had been working for some time in this community with renters um, to let them know about the Southwest Corridor project, to talk about what potential impacts it could have on the community, and to get them engaged. So they've been doing that work um, 
um, under a contract with the city of Tigard actually for several months in advance of this meeting. We hired them to do outreach for this meeting and to help us facilitate the meeting. And they worked very, very closely again with the church and the, um, the pastor who does the Spanish speaking services at the church. And he brought in a lot of the um, church members to participate in this event. So we got great participation. Um, it was a bilingual event. We did it in Spanish and English. We had translators there for um, a couple of other languages too. We weren't as successful um, just because it was difficult to get outreach, um, all the outreach staff we needed but we did have great um, participation from English speakers and Spanish speakers. And what we did, since it was during the DEIS comment period, we provided an opportunity for people to provide testimony, official testimony on the draft environmental impact statement at this meeting at the church. So they didn't have to attend a different meeting. Um, they didn't have to go to a formal public hearing in city hall, but we had one of those. We had two of them over at Tigard City Hall. Um, but instead of asking people to come out of their comfort zone and meet us at a government building, we also had this event um, in the church. So two of our steering committee members, so two elected officials from the Metro Council, um, attended this meeting and took testimony from the participants who were there. Everyone who wanted to speak, to speak had an opportunity to do that. Uh, I think the majority of testimony was in Spanish, and there was a translator there to translate their Spanish um, for, the, for the two elected officials that were there to hear them. I think the event was very successful because um, you could sense a feeling of being heard in the audience. Um, the people who participated um, felt like it was worth their time coming because they got to have their voices heard. And by having the elected officials there, it was um, it helped solidify that feeling that they were influencing the project and that the project had gone out of its way to hear from them. Um, so it was a very, very big success. It took a lot of investment and in, um, time. Um, but it was worth it in the end because of the participation we were able to get. In addition to the testimony, um, several people who were still too nervous to speak provided written testimony in Spanish and English, which also became part of the draft environmental impact statement comment period. And then the last example I want to share, this is an event, again, it was partnership. Um, not all of our events were, but um, these ones that I'm highlighting are, we participate, we partnered, partnered with Momentum Alliance, which is a group here in Portland, the Portland area that works with youth of color to engage them in um, projects in their community and with um, to, to, to get change for their communities. They helped organize students and we provide for students. So students were paid to spend a Saturday with us, learning about the project and sharing their thoughts and ideas with us. Um, again, I think it was successful because we had close to 30 students. All Look how focused they are on this map. <laughs> they were really paying attention. They were learning about the project and they were providing feedback to us about what was important to their community. This is a hard to reach audience that would be difficult to engage without the partnerships that we've been able to put together to have this kind of event. Um, and so this was a really successful event too. So I think that's a good place for us to stop and take questions from the group. Uh, thank you, Erin and Wendy. For those viewing the webinar, please feel free to continue to submit your questions if you have them. It looks like we already have a number of questions from the audience. Uh, two of the questions focus on sort of the same topic, which is measuring authenticity and what are some ways, Wendy and Erin, that you can do that after engagement. Um, noting that sometimes the number of surveys or the number of meetings isn't necessarily going to measure the level of effective engagement. Sure. Yeah, I can kick this one off. Um, it's a really good question, and it's a it's um, something that professionals in public engagement are thinking about a lot: is how to measure your engagement, the success of your engagement. So, of course, we do rely on numbers in some cases because the numbers are informative in some ways. 
They don't tell you the whole story. But the number of people that you have at your event or the number of comments you're able to receive or the number of comments you receive in different languages tell you a little bit about who's engaged. Very useful to um, collect demographic information from those that are participating because that can tell you, um, give you feedback about how you're achieving your goals. So that's another, if, if you're thinking about how you measure your authenticity based on the goals that you came into your process with, um, then you want to be able to reflect on um, how successful you've been engaging the type of people that you wanted to engage. So that's, that's a piece of it, and it re re relates to the numbers, of course. Um, but I think what you also want us to get at is how do you measure the level of trust or how people feel about their participation in the process. So I also like to do surveys, and I tend to do them um, together with those demographic questions, um, is to allow to ask people questions about the event and how they felt about it. So those questions can include things like, um, did you feel heard? Did you get the information you needed at the event today? Um, did you feel that um, staff was working well with you? Um, I've got a series of questions that I've used um, in the past. I use them at how did, it's also helpful to ask questions like how did you hear about today's event? So you can know what which of your outreach act, um, um, efforts worked the best. Um, recently, I've done this for several committees and we'll use the same set of questions and ask them at the beginning and then a couple times in the middle and then at the end of the process. So then you have, um, you can see progress over time in your ability to address those. Um, you can see how you, you've been evaluated and you can also do them at events uh, during the Southwest Corridor open houses. We, um, we had a feedback form, so I had a couple of questions, like I explained, about how people felt about the event, how um, whether they felt like they were heard, uh, whether they felt the event was worth their time, and then on the other side of the questionnaire were um, demographic questions that were optional. But we had a raffle. We managed to get a couple donated things. Um, we didn't pay any money for the prizes, um, but people got really excited about the prizes. Um, and in order to get a ticket to participate in the raffle, you had to turn in your evaluation form. I have never been so successful in getting evaluation forms back, so I'm gonna remember that for the future. It's helpful to have some kind of incentive to help get those filled out. Um, and uh, that was a good way to learn about how people felt about the meeting and whether they felt we had authentic engagement. Um, and something, this is Wendy, something I would add too is that you, if you did partner with uh, CBOs, community-based organizations, it can be helpful to also debrief an interview with them and ask them how they think it went. Um, but I agree with Erin, a big indicator can also be just like the amount of um, comments you get back and then what languages those comments are in. Um, it'll tell you about your process and how successful you were at making people feel at ease by giving you those comments back. Okay, great. Um, that sort of leads into one of the second questions, which is, what do you recommend for community partnerships in smaller municipalities or cities that don't necessarily have the nonprofit infrastructure that you can tap into that Portland has? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, frankly, Southwest Portland is not an area well covered by CBOs either. So as we were working on Southwest Corridor, that was a challenge from the beginning. But of course, it's a, it's more of a challenge when um, um, when you're in a smaller community that has fewer CBOs. So um, it's nice when you have those organizations that are always together. But really, the thought behind this is that you want trusted community resources. So anyone in your community who is trusted by the folks you want to reach out to um, is who you want to partner with, if possible. Um, a go-to is often churches or any civic organization that you um, can think of that um, attracts the, the type of people that are on your list. So in saying this, I hope you're recognizing how important it is to have done that previous step of knowing it, knowing who it is that you want to target. Um, 
And if you're focusing your attention on the ones that will be the hardest, then that's where you're spending the mo most of your time because this is gonna take time because it's about building relationships. Um, I would recommend going to um, churches and leaders and churches to talk to them to say, hey, you know, I've got this project. I think your the people who uh, your congregation, the people at your community will be interested in this and it has a potential to impact them in these ways. Um, and find out what they think about its relevancy for their um, community and engage how interested they are in working with you and what they might need in return for the support that they give you. So we've made, um, I've worked on projects that made donations to churches as a way of working with that church um, to engage their um, congregation. But you don't have to think, churches, again, a CBO or a church is, an quote unquote easier one because those are organizations that exist. But you might need to think deeper into just who those leaders, who the trusted people in that community is. And depending on the culture that you're working with, um, that can that can vary. And it'll help you to have people of that culture to help you understand who the trusted leadership tend to be for that community. And I would just add, if if you're the one as an agency that has to create those those um, partnerships directly with the community, there are ways of thinking outside the box to try to um, set a precedent. Um, so attending ESL classes and um, figuring out where those communities uh, frequent will be great. So if the church is in um, a tool, just figuring out. Um, where those communities um, live, what they frequent. I think grocery stores too that are ethnic specific uh, can be a, a resource to you and maybe understand that maybe your first meeting is not going to be about what you actually want to talk about or the project you're trying to push forward. It may require more time in just like building that relationship. Uh, Centro Cultural from Washington County just did an event um, about two weeks ago with TriMed Metro and the port of Hillsborough to um, just, there was no agenda. The only agenda was to get people to turn out. And they did this by doing what in Spanish culture we call taquiza. And so they literally just gave out free tacos to community. And there was no limit in, um, they had music and they made it a fun event and there was no agenda. Um, I was there from TriMet to talk about our low income fair and to talk about HOP the new way to pay for fare, um, but it was just really reassuring to see that over, I think, 100 or I think 1,500 tacos were eaten and like hundreds of people came out to the event. Um, so that's a great example of, sure, this is a CBO that put the event together, but if you identify opportunities like this, think outside the box and see what you could do to just make sure people know that you're out there and that you could be a resource without having an agenda of I want to talk about project A, B, and C, um, just just to build a relationship and build agency with that community. Great. Um, another question was, how do you thread the needle, so to speak, um, when you are encouraging people to attend events with incentives such as childcare or say prizes, and then making a assumption that some groups need those resources, but others do not. Um, well, first of all, when you, what I have found to be true is that when you think of ways to make an event accessible or fun for a particular community, it benefits everybody. Um, the raffle was not just fun for the target audience that we had in mind, but for everyone who attended that event. So um, I might not completely understand the question, but I think the idea is um, focus your time and energy on the groups you want to target and thinking about what obstacles are in their way for to participate. And by removing those obstacles, you're actually likely providing helpful and useful tools for others in the community that may not, may have come anyway, but will also benefit and enjoy those, um, that special work that you've done. Okay, um, on that note, 
how do you manage risk and liability with things like offering food or childcare? Some agencies are very risk averse, adverse. So what ways can you get around this or ease the agency into feeling more comfortable with using those sort of outreach methods? Yeah, good question. So um, it's definitely been, it's been a, a learning curve here at Metro. Um, in fact, it, I think it's only been in the last year ish that we've been able to provide actual babysitters in the past. Um, I've done a lot of open house type events or meetings where we had children's activities and we couldn't call it babysitting because we didn't have licensed babysitters, but we had staff who were at tables um, and they had snacks and they had activities for children to do. We always try to put those activity tables in a very visible place. Um, so that parents are not checking in or out their kids with a, um, a licensed person, but it's just an opportunity for kids to have something to do if they come. And so that that is a way of avoiding the liability of actually having licensed um, or giving the impression that you have babysitters that aren't licensed. So I think here at Metro, we've gotten to the point now where we have contracted um, with state certified babysitters to provide babysitting at events, but I recognize that not agent, every agency is going to be um, comfortable doing that, so the, the um, kids activities might be a good step. Um, also, we run into limitations all the time in terms of how certain funds can be spent. Um, federal money can't be spent on food. So you have to find workarounds. Um, very often here, it's just using different pools of money. Um, to provide food at events. Um, yeah, I've gotten, like I said, I've gotten prizes donated most of the time so that we weren't spending money on that. But um, And Wendy mentioned uh, providing hot passes. So as a transit agency, they can, it, it, I assume it's easier to provide um, bus passes than it is to provide cash. Um, but I think it's important to start talking with your agency about the importance of compensating people for their time. Um, that we're not that giving people a gift card from a from Fred Meyer is not bribing people to come to a meeting. Instead, it's compensating them for the time that they have taken off from work to be there. Um, that you that you're making that by giving people transit passes, you're making it um, able for them to be at that meeting when they don't have a car. So um, it's a conversation that has to start, um, and you probably inch your way along, but you work around it as much as you can before. And I will also like to add, it was for the previous question, that um, focusing on one group doesn't take away from the others. Um, I think most meetings that we've hosted in partnership with CBOs, and unless it's a specific focus group, um, the invitations are open on our website for everybody mainly in English, but then we translate those flyers and give them to the CBOs to do their own canvassing per se. So they are still very much open to the broader community, um, and most of them are advertised in English to most, um, you know, most of the people that are following the project along or through our social media um, websites, which most projects have. Um, so, so that's a way, too, to make sure that you're not feeling like you're excluding others. Um, and then making your materials um, accessible in the languages you've identified as being the top languages. Uh, always, because engineers, planners, agency folks speak English, there will always be in English. Um, it'll just be being mindful of the other languages that you're also expecting. So I hope that helps as well. Um, Lisa, did you want to ask the final question? Oh, I'm sorry, Emma. I was uh, confused by that. Feel free to um, ask the final question. Looks like we do have time for one more, and then we can wrap up the webinar. Okay, great. Um, on that note, Wendy and Aaron, what kind of funding um, do you use at Metro and TriMet? to do those sort of outreach techniques that involve gift cards or food or child care? So, All right, hey, Wendy, you go first. This is Wendy. Um, what I can speak from, um, for example, we had 
new money coming to our agency via some legislation known as HB 2017. Um, and we use some of our general fund money to do contracting specifically with community-based organizations um, where we wanted to focus on. So part of, pretty much part of the bid for the CBO or part of the pay that we provided to the um, agency or organization we worked with, um, they had to add on the per se the gift card and what we have used um, more, in, more in the past is the hop cards which um, they're usually three dollars retail price and then we tend to put about five dollars in it so you're getting um, an eight dollar value um, and then we make sure that we are providing food at all of the uh, meetings that, that we hosted and this is not as much as a, a, a TriMed rule per se but when you're working with those CBOs they're guiding your engagement and they're telling us this is what's going to make it most effective um, so we try to use general fund money which is more accessible um, and with less strings attached um, to do some of the engagement. I've also been part of projects like Division Transit where we are using our, our allotted money from the project to engage and to do the engagement. Um, and it can be difficult. I mean, especially when you're when you're talking about food for anywhere from 50 to 60 people, um, it it really adds up. So I think this is when partnerships are really um, fabulous. As I mentioned before, we had partnered with the city of Portland because they were also doing a really big project in an area where we were also working in. So we were able to pay for the venue, TriMet as an agency, and then uh, city of Portland was able to provide the catering food. And so that way the costs are kind of split up between between the projects. Um, and that can be a tool for you um, when, when you're working with other agencies. Um, my answer is very similar because the Southwest Corridor is not yet a fend federally funded project. We've had the flexibility of being able to purchase food um, and we could pay for babysitting that way. But also several of our events were partnerships. So the, the one at St. Anthony's Church that was bilingual Spanish and English, I showed you the picture of. In that case, um, uh, Metro was paying for the facilitation and for the um, materials and the outreach in advance of the meeting, but the city of Tigard used, um, and I can't say for certain what funds they used, but they provided funding for other aspects of the project, including food. Um, so you might be able to put that together with different partnerships. Um, I can also say that we've worked with consultants so in the case of Momentum Alliance, we had a contract with Momentum Alliance to run that event. And so the food, the payment to participants, all of that was paid by Momentum from their contract with us. And having that, um, having that through the consultant made it um, easier. I worked, before I came to Metro, worked for a um, public involvement consultant. And I know that often our clients found that it was easier to have, the, have us as the consultant pay for some of those items or provide them um, so that they weren't providing it directly. Okay, great. Um, being mindful that it is 11.03 and understanding if attendees have to leave, we do have one final question before we wrap it up uh, for both of you. And that is um, in smaller municipalities or smaller organizations with very limited funding, um, if you were in that situation, what would you focus on? What are the best bang for your buck if you are really strapped for cash? Yeah, I think that's a really good. Um, I think that's a really good question, and so I want to take you back to the the strategizing and the um, the thinking ahead that you do when you're putting your project together. And thinking about your resources is really important, not just your your um, cash available, but also the staff time that you have available. Um, and if you think about those audiences, like in that um, orbits, um, you know that you're going to have some of the regular people who are always very active involved. So just decide that you're not going to spend, like decide what activities you can do that spend the least amount of time um, working to bring them along in the process. Um, it might even mean going to fewer neighborhood association meetings than you might normally go to or um, not meeting with Mr. Jones privately for 
or having hour long conversations with one individual that take up a lot of your time, but to actually make a strategic choice to spend a little bit less time um, with them. It might be something like you can provide an online survey, which doesn't take very much time, but allows you to hear from the people who you know, are engaged and will participate or that you provide emails that have updates about the project, but you're not having individual conversations with a lot of people. And instead then focus, okay, what is the target audience we want? And what is a maybe a little piece of that? Like how can we make a first step into that and choose one activity that you wanna plan? Or I can't tell you what that one activity that's gonna give you the best bang for your buck because it depends on your project and your community. But I think if you focus on the goal that you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to reach, um, you can identify um, the type of activity that you can afford and that's gonna be the most effective in reaching that group. And it might be baby steps from what you've done in the past, just starting to do things a little bit differently. Um, and that's okay because it's those baby steps that will get you to, um, to more authentic engagement over time. And the only thing I will add, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but when we went out to the supermarket that focuses on um, Latino products, so that's when we were able to talk to about 50 to 60 people in a very short period of time, and there was only two staff um, available. Um, there was really a very low cost other than like our you know, usual hourly pay or salary, and, and then added to that, we had maybe a budget of like less than $50 to buy treats in order to try to attract folks to the tables. Um, but it was very successful. And so understanding too, again, what you do have available inside of your organization, what language skills you already have, and what kind of relationships those individuals may already have into their community can be also very helpful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin and Wendy, for your time today um, and your presentation and a lot of great questions. So thanks, um, attendees, for um, submitting those. At this time, we are going to conclude the webinar. Um, thank you again for joining us. Please visit our websites if you want to find more about our professional development offerings. And we will be sending an email, a post-webinar email, with the video recording and PDF of the slides. All right. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.